All right, uh, hello and good evening, everyone. This is a uh, Blue Edge Virtual Seminar. This is our 22nd Blue Edge Virtual Seminar. Blue Edge Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current manage management updates of different health related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Edge Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Adam Gitacho. I'm the co-founder and CTO at uh, Blue Health Ethiopia. And it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Abdul Salam Asafa here with us. Dr. Abdul Salam Asafa is an assistant professor of uh, psychiatry, and uh, he is going to give us uh, a presentation on breaking bad news topic. Thank you very much, Adam. Hello guys, nice to meet you all. And I would like to begin also by apologizing for the inconvenience, you know, with this new technology, especially it's, it's not a good time, you know, to test uh, new things, especially in presenting or having a discussion. So I will just go straight into the discussion since we already have uh, spent enough amount of time uh, in introducing and also due to the delay in starting our session today. So uh, I have a couple of rules here. If you have any questions, you can drop them uh, uh, in the box, I think in the question box, and also you can raise your hands. And I think Adam, will only, can you also notify me on those questions, especially as we go along if there are things that need to be clarified, it's better to raise them in, in between the sessions. Although we'll have Q&A sessions at the end of the session also. So if you think that it's very relevant to ask the questions in between um, uh, while the, same in the session is going, it's also possible to do that. Other is, since I have turned off my camera for quality of network, I will not have enough access to see your reactions for this, so it is somewhat blind, blind-sided kind of uh, session on me, so if I have difficulty of hearing or my voice is not loud enough, not only in other uh, issues, you can also uh, tell me in between. So let's start our session. So this is a very important session, breaking bad news for any physician or working uh, any uh, healthcare uh, professional. It's a very important part of our job. We break news almost on daily basis, whether it's a big news or, you know, you know on a small day-to-day -day, uh, phenomena. So it's, it's quite important to know how to proceed or how to go about it because uh, it affects the patient's life in a very, very uh, detrimental way. So it's, it's one of the things that is a life-changing uh, experience for the patients. So we'll, we'll discuss what bad news is basically and what makes it difficult for the patient and also for the physician or uh, here as the bearer of bad news. That. And we'll see some methods or protocols of delivering bad news from various literatures. I tried to consolidate them into few points. There are various methods or protocols of delivering bad news that generally involve certain aspects of communication and also having emotional connection with the patient and uh, preparation phase. So we'll, we'll also discuss those things. And there are common pitfalls we usually do in conveying the bad, bad, bad news to the patient. We'll also raise them in this case. Later we'll have question and answer sessions. So bad news is generally a relative concept because it depends on the patient's perspective of the new. For example, certain news for one patient might not be that much, that might not have a, such a detrimental effect on another patient. For example, having to have, you know, one or two fingers to be removed for, and uh, a daily level or, for example, a pain 
might be might not be the same news as another person who might not use a hand frequently. So it's a relative concept, depends on the patient's perspective of the news. But generally, there is a comprehensive uh, definition. We, we can conclude that if the news starts a feeling of no hope, hopelessness, or it brings stress to the person's mental or physical well-being in the short or long term, or if there is any risk of upset in to already established lifestyle, for example, dietary, lifestyle original or any other kind of lifestyle or generally a message which is given uh, to patients that conveys to an individual with fewer choices in their life in his or, in his or her life for example in case of uh, conveying the news to a patient uh, concluding that the patient has diabetes that really narrows the patient's choice or in regarding dietary lifestyle and also if the patient is preferring sedentary lifestyle, you might need to, need to get up and do exercise. So these are the things that may limit the patient's freedom of choice in certain aspects. So it, all, it, it might also happen in those uh, uh, perspectives. Generally, any kind of life-threatening condition, as we have seen earlier, any threat to life, whether stroke, MI, MHL, or any other thing. Having a degenerative disease, especially in the old age, especially if it's on early onset, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and others, uh, MLS might also be uh, severe or bad news for the patient. Neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, intellectual disability, these are also things that, 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 that might uh, stir a huge emotional upset especially for the caregivers and parents of children who are, affect, who are affected by it. So it, it, it there's a huge uh, weight on the parents as well. Any kind of disabling disease or outcomes, for example, an outcome of a certain kind of surgery or a disabling disease that needs to be you know, addressed, for example, a patient having a weight country and needs to have an above knee amputation. These are things that might also have a detrimental effect on the patient's lifestyle and uh, generally attitude toward the future and adjusting their role in life. Recurrences or treatment failures could also be bad news, especially in, in, in oncology cases like the tumor, tumor recurrence. Patients might be celebrating, you no know, winning. Uh, I mean, uh, having won over, uh, going, going over severe uh, phases of chemotherapy and radiotherapy and finally having a relief that they don't have cancer anymore and later for various reasons that might be recurrent. So that's also as bad as having a tumor or cancer the first time. Conveying to couples that they are infertile might also be very detrimental. So these are some of the examples that might uh, be categorized as bad news. Generally, the reason was that we should know about it. the techniques of breaking bad news, as we said earlier, is part of our daily activity for an clinician. You know, conveying that a patient have uh, malaria could be detrimental for the patient unexpectedly, so it could it could start so with something mild infectiousness up to severe life threatening illness, depending on the patient's perception. So it requires generally certain of skill and it needs preparation. It, it, it involves uh, a heavy set of emotion, so the patient usually gets emotional and. Due to that uh, preparation is mandatory. So, in order to prepare, we should also know how to break bad news to the patient. The other is generally the practice of, you know, uh, non, not confiding the disease, the progress of, or the prognosis of the illness to the patients is not that much practice. You know. So, patients' autonomy must be respected. Everything about an illness, their prognosis, uh, treatment outcome, everything should also be conveyed to the patient. So 
due to that, due to that, we, we can't really escape from breaking bad. And it also helps for better adjustment for the patient as well as the physician. We'll see it later. If any kind of bad news will result in adjustment difficulty for the patient. Sometimes it, it also uh, says a certain difficulty for the physician. The physician might, might get frustrated and might feel like they are not able to help the patient, especially if they are connected intimately, if, if the, it's a patient that had a long time follow up with them. Coming uh, or breaking bad news might have its own effect on the emotional effect on the physician, on the physician itself. So, so knowing how to handle those kinds of things is also helpful. The other most important thing that is helpful is it also helps us to save the patient or family energy or kind of money. So sometimes, you know, in order to not to be to protect ourselves from being the bearer of bad news or you know, giving the patient bad news. Sometimes we don't usually convey the whole message, so we don't usually convey the whole information. Or so patients might get the wrong idea that uh, disease could be treated, uh, even if it's not uh, it's not uh, cured. So they might also get the wrong idea that there is also alternate. Uh, treatment options. So they might, you know, go to seek out other treatments in other cities. So conveying all the possible treatment, all the possible problems is also helpful to take the patient from spending a lot of money or energy looking for solution somewhere else. So it is very difficult to break bad news due to two reasons from the patient's perspective as well as from the when you see it from the physician's perspective, it's generally difficult. What makes it difficult for the patient is it presents an adjustment from a problem for the patient. So, for example, one day the patient is you know having a family, the, the patient might be expecting a baby or expecting a promotion in his uh, uh, company, or he, the patient might just start a new business and having you know thoughts about the future. So having this bad news in the middle of uh, those activities might be a very difficult uh, thing to deal with. So it, it, it brings a huge kind of uh, load of emotion for the patient. Generally, any kind of bad news, especially if it affects the patient's uh, mental and physical well-being, it will have a life-changing experience on the patient. The patient's lifestyle might have to be changed. The patient might change his attitude for the future and generally for life in, in, in good or bad. Sometimes patients get hopeless and see life in a very pessimistic way and then, you know, get even dead wishes and sometimes they get suicidal. Or in the other in patients might even get blissful ideas and try to get happiness and, you know, get a lot of emotions from it, the little things in life and life at the end might start to give a meaning for this kind of patient. The other, it also uh, changes the feeling of freedom for the patient because, you know, one thing it could result in disability and also it might restrain their financial freedom, their, short, uh, their social uh, activities might also be Started during uh, having an illness, especially in chronic illnesses. Generally, the patient's hopes and dreams might also be challenged due to the illness prognosis. And roles and responsibility might might also be uh, challenged. For example, the patient, as we said earlier, might be expecting a baby on the way, might be expecting a promotion, or generally is a person who is already taking care of his whole family by himself and then if he dies or if, if he got if he can't do his job anymore due to the disability or if he had this huge financial burden from the, the illness that he just got these are the things that might impair the role of the patient and that might hinder his uh, ability to fully engage in executing his responsibility so it's a, a very worrying 
kind of care we want for the patient if we see it from the patient's perspective you have to adjust your whole life in a way that that will help him to just uh, cope with the disease and also uh, to go through it successfully whether having pursuing treatment or any other means so it it presents a really a huge problem for the patient that is also not only problem for the patient that the physician might also have their own if uh, might also have this own difficulty on conveying the bad news to the patient so we might feel uncertain about the patient expectation that's one of the things that might you know trigger fear and also emotional turmoil in our uh, side because what if the patient you know sometimes to the point of fainting losing consciousness you know getting agitated getting angry getting sad crying these are emotions nobody wants to deal you know with so we usually tend to avoid these kinds of emotions so you know voluntarily getting yourself into these kinds of uh, emotional settings or setups needs a huge kind of preparation so usually patients uh, i mean physicians get distressed due to that if you remember yourself from you know your clinical experiences this is our day to day experience as we go into our clinics our office or towards our patient we are usually you know very uncertain about what the patient is going how the patient is going to react and we also we are also fearful of destroying the patient's hope so we feel responsible because usually the psychological setup for any any physician is you know we have this rescue fantasy we we, we depict ourselves as somewhat of rescuer we were always depicted as a helper of patients relieving the stress of the patient so this directly goes against our you know very fundamental uh, pride and also uh, Uh, egotistical expectation so we feel like we are destroying the patient so, so we, we don't we don't want to do that it, 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 it again starts a lot of anxiety and uh, fear in our uh, part other is it, it also makes up inadequate in the face of especially if they are uncontrolled like uh, in stage uh, life in uh, conditions like uh, Uh, cancer it, it, it makes us very helpless you know so it also we can't really pre- present any kind if, if you feel like we, do, we can't really present any kind of help for the patient we don't usually want to face those patients and sometimes we don't feel prepared to manage the patient's anticipated emotional reaction so we, we just kind of want to uh, postpone them sometimes we usually especially if we are inexperienced we tend to give this very optimistic picture for the patient so we examine a woman and we get lamp on her breast and we tell them we tell them she is we tell her she is fine we don't really expect it to be a, a cancer it's just a mild benign kind of tumor and then when the result gets back it becomes cancer now we are in, in this situation where we, we have to you know convince her again that she has really uh, a very serious illness so especially uh, this is an important step for all of us until we are very sure that uh, results are have a very optimistic future for the patients it's better to refrain from conveying a very optimistic kind of picture for the patient because it's also very detrimental for the patient the, the patient will be caught of guard just like you will be caught of guard and then it will have uh, traumatic kind of uh, reaction for the patient so generally due to the principle of ethical autonomy we just is very advisable ethically to give the information for the patient as long as the patient has the full capacity to understand what's going on and to understand the future plan of treatment but if you feel like the patient is not able to understand the consequence of the illness and also the future for treatment for example if the patient is psychotic 
and this delirious comatus or other thing, of course, we are going to convey the message to the significant other for the family. If the generally for children, we usually uh, involve parents involved in that. So there are various ways of delivering news, about five or six, but generally involve, as we said earlier, a couple of methods they usually involve similar set of structures. So these are the general set of ideas that we should always consider. So as a physician, we must know our limits first. So we are not there to, you know, treat the untreatable. We are not there to uh, show miracles or anything. We will be we will be working in the bounds of the scientific uh, uh, literature and knowledge. So, what we are going to do for the patients is as much as what we are capable of, and we should always be aware of that in delivering the values. And it's better to show not to show fear and frustration because sometimes we are fearful and frustration. These kinds of emotions tend to be, you know. Contagious and the, the patient becomes very fearful and frustrated because then again you see your facial expression and then uh, the patient might start panicking. And we should also know that receiving and processing any kind of bad news in the process and it takes time for the patient to make this easy. So although we are going to may use these kinds of methods of delivering bad news, that does not mean that the patient will be okay and will be sad anymore, will not be angry anymore, he will make himself, uh, he'll make uh, his peace with the diagnosis. And, uh, it, it takes a very, very long time, sometimes weeks, months, sometimes the patient might get depressed. It's part of a griefing process. So we, we should not really expect every emotion of the patient to be relieved or to be treated in that specific moment of delivering value. The most important objective of our Method using methods of delivery values to give the news in as much body and comfortable way as possible. So that's what the major objective is not just to treat and alleviate any kind of sadness and emotion or any kind of other problem that the patient might have after hearing the bad news. So as much as possible, if we, if we make it empathic and comfortable enough for the patient, the patient might get enough time and also uh, enough support to express his emotion. And then when when he later tries to process what's going on, when he later tries to adjust his life around it, he might be able to better to cope um, about the process. So adjustment issues here are the main concern for the patient or for the patient. So as we said, at, at the moment you tell the patient he have any kind of condition that that uh, bad for him. The first thing they usually think about is the physical, you know, psychological, or mental well-being, and then they will start to think about their family, their business, and other things. So it's it's a whole lot of adjustment in their life. They they, they have to recalculate their life again, whether they are they will be in it in the future or they expecting expecting to be they will be not in it in the future. Either way, it's a huge amount of adjustment for them. So as you know, adjustment takes a little bit of time. It generally involves a lot of grieving, a lot of anxiety, sadness, denial, anger, frustration, and depression might So all delivering methods of bad news generally involve good preparation, they may also they may they must also have effective communication and we should always provide emotional uh, support. So before delivering any kind of value, we have to prepare first. This is one of the things where as a, as a physician, especially if we are working in emergency or PD setting, this is one of the things we usually ignore, but it's the most fundamental aspect of delivering value. We have to prepare ourselves and also our colleagues, before we start uh, communicating with the patient, we have to familiar our, or familiarize ourselves with the condition of the patient, the name of the patient, the age 
well, to make sure that we get the name and the age right and also the the chart of the patient right because it's a huge kind of deal for the patient and the other it we have to also familiarize ourselves with the diagnosis of the patient what kind of diagnosis he have the medical history if if it's possible it's best to know the background of the patient where he's coming from whether he have family or not whether he's married or not these are the things that might help us in later a garnering or you know uh, uh, collecting the social support for the patient so we have to also familiarize ourselves with the test result and the future management or treatment option and plan for that patient so we have to prepare that in advance before meeting the patient because then we'll have a very clear understanding of the patient and a very clear preparation for what to tell the patient when we meet. The other is preparing the patient. So it's very unfortunate in most of our setups, lab usually private and also uh, comfortable areas. But it's best advice to get the patient in a very private setting. It's not totally advisable to give patients news in the corridor in, or in the middle of the emergency where other you know, patients are also being seen as much as possible trying to get a private kind of setup in a private room is advisable and sitting and getting comfortable is also good because it helps some relax and then it also shows that you are not in a rush and you are there to help them uh, go through it emotionally and it's also better if the setting is more quiet and also trying to if we are in a very busy setting then if our phone is being hit repeatedly it's better to switch off or uh, making the phone silent the other is preparing uh, building rapport so in building rapport this is just building the therapeutic relation with the patient so we start with the patient's name and age and then once we make sure that we got that right we ask them how they are doing how they are uh, going along with the symptoms whether there are new symptoms or not and then if there are any other things we can talk about it it's a little bit of talk so that the patient gets comfortable in talk, uh, continuing the conversation the other is preparing the patient so we ask the patient's understanding of their condition we have to prepare the patient for the coming you know so we ask them whether that they have any clue about what, about the illness they have sometimes patients guess it you know for example they might have relatives they might have heard, uh, heard it from the news they might have googled it they might have seen it from youtube or uh, have a relative who got to the same path and they might usually suspect that they have that kind of illness. So knowing the expectation of the patient is usually good to uh, predict whether the patient will react in a certain way because the patient might usually know, might already know what kind of severe illness they have and then the reaction might be uh, that much easier. And also in preparing the patient, we have to ask how much they want to know. This is one of the questions that we should ask. We should always ask them how much they want to know about their illness. For example, we might do many tests, blood tests, imaging, biopsy, and other MS and other tests might be run. But the patient might generally want to know what they have from rather than going to the detailed uh, blood tests. So we have to also ask them how much they want to know and also uh, the details of things that they want. This is usually uh, happens in, while we are in the conversation. So always asking if they want to know how much they want to know. Sometimes patients even might not even want to know any kind of information about their illness. And they, might want, they might want to take time. So we have to always respect the patient's autonomy. Although that might be again at the the benefits of the patient. The autonomy comes, you know, precedes the beneficial part, you know, so uh, that's also the case here.
So always we should make sure that the patient wants to know, and if they want to know how much they want to know the details of this. Right? Sometimes the patients might want just want what type of inner they have. They, they don't want to know the prognosis. They might want to know the, the, the stage of the illness. So knowing in advance the patient's preference is, uh, is really helpful in, in, in selecting what type of information that we are going to provide. So as we said, using plain and clear language is very highly recommend. So uh, using languages that are highly jungled with jargon with medical terms, using very unclear and ambiguous terms, and uh, uh, th those are terms that might also confuse the patient and might uh, not be help that much helpful in, in helping the patient uh, deal with uh, the bad news in the beginning. We should always give the information in a small chunk that, that, that might also help us or allow us to give the patient a little bit of time to react with whatever information for information we are showing to us. And so, you know, bombarding them with information upon information might, might uh, uh, take away the very best opportunity for them to express their uh, emotional reaction to every bit of information they are receiving. We should always uh, try to understand the level of understanding of the patients in the social culture and background. Sometimes patients might, might have difficulty of understanding even the language that we are speaking. So using translators, trying to tone down our interview, our conversation as much as possible to the level of understanding of the patient. Is uh, the best thing to uh, in providing the information as much as possible, giving time for any kind of reaction or any kind of information. So we provide information, we wait for the patient to react to it. Sorry that uh, I'm really bad, I have really bad news. The results came back, uh, they, they were not that much uh, expected, of, uh, they were not the news that. Expected. It shows that you have cancer, it shows that you have this kind of illness. And I'm sorry to tell you that. So, after doing that, we wait for the patient to react to the news. And then, after uh, hearing the reaction, the patients might generally say uh, they, may, they may immediately get sad, angry, or a little bit, or might go into denial. How could this be? I, I, I can't have that kind of illness. I'm, uh, very good uh, fit man, I, am, I, I do physical exercise, I'm very cautious with my nutrition, kind of response might be uh, provided for the patient. And then we will continue our response that although these are the conditions that might help you prevent from this kind of illness, unfortunately, some patients might have this kind of illness, also they always uh, do the preventive method. So it's not something that you, uh, you didn't do to prevent. Illness is just it's just how it is. It, it, it can happen in any in anybody in any person. So this are the this is how the conversation goes with the patient. We'll see some locally prepared uh, uh, example later. I'll have a, a short role play. Okay. So as we are providing the information, it goes in parallel to provide the support. So while we are providing the information or after we provide the information, providing emotional support is the main, the key variable and delivering value. So we have to acknowledge and identify the patient's emotion. I can see that it's very frustrating. It's very uh, sad thing to hear. I'm sorry uh, that you have to, have to hear this kind of things might be helpful for the patient to get uh, the feeling of being validated and if the uh, so patient might even go into long kind of silence so if they go into those kind of things and we might have to ask them or probe how they are feeling so i can see that you're sad can you tell me a little bit about it more kind of questions might be a probing kind of question for them that presents an opportunity for the patient to present or express their emotions 
have to always allow them time to express their emotion. So as we said, it's, it's breaking barriers is not something that we do in a rush or while waiting on the corridor or uh, while we have a patient next door and then while we have patient waiting next door. So as much as possible, creating our schedule, not for the day, of course, but you know, 30 minutes or one hour or 10 minutes, depending on our expectation, might be mandated. So as much as possible, not, not making a uh, rush, allowing time for the patients to express their emotions, providing tissues, comfort, obviously, not good for your family. And if there are family members, allowing them to console, uh, provide support for the patient. Sometimes the family members might, themselves might get into shock and also denial and I mean, there's sad, there's sadness, so it's also helpful to extend that level of support to the family members. And as the patient is expressing their sadness and anger or any other emotion, it's very good to listen empathically. So maintaining our eye contact, don't nodding along as they are you know, speaking, leaning forward and showing interest is really a good way of showing that we are really interested in what they are saying and that uh, it's really in tune into the emotions of the patient. And, uh, providing affirmations here and then might be difficult. I, I can see that uh, how much difficult is uh, for you considering your kind of lifestyle, considering that you are a kid here, considering that you have something waiting for this kind of job, like these things might be helpful for the patient. It, it, it makes them feel understood. So after providing the information and providing the necessary support, we uh, the final point is providing the plan. So we have to provide a clear, clear plan for the future of the treatment options. And we offer uh, them time to meet and talk some other time if they want to discuss while there is a uh, uh, family member with them. So sometimes patients just uh, default from Having after having heard the bad news, they might not want to discuss about the treatment option or the other. So I have to understand that it takes time to process it and just decide for the treatment plan. So we have to be cautious not to rush the patient to make especially treatment plans after hearing the bad news. If they want uh, continue with the plan, that's also good. But if they are stressed and uh, want to defer for the moment is also advisable to give them that opportunity. So those are the four main, you know, pillars for approaching or breaking bad news. Generally, there are a lot of approaches for breaking bad news, a lot of, of course, acronyms, but the most uh, commonly used is the spikes approach for breaking bad news. We'll go through them uh, one by one in a very fast manner. So the ABCD approach generally usually follows all of the approach usually for the four pillar, follow the four pillar. It's just words are manipulated here. So advanced preparation, we prepare, as we said earlier, we build the therapeutic relation, we talk with the patient. It's just having a small talk so that the patient might be comfortable with us to talk and express emotion better. We have to communicate well. It's a two-way communication. We have to effectively, clearly, with understandable language, convey the message and make sure that the patient understands the message. And then give time and space for the patient to ask any questions, to express their emotion. And then, then dealing with the patient with family reaction afterwards and encouraging and validating the emotions is generally the ABCD approach or uh, breaking bad news. The other is the uh, SWAIQ technique. So in this case also, it, it starts from the preparation. We say the thing as much as possible. This approach usually is used in emergency settings or in times where we don't have that much time. Also, it's not advisable to do that, but if that's the case, it's, it's, best, it's best to use this. Uh, approach. So we take the same as much as possible, as, as soon as possible, and we assess the understanding of the patient. We ask, we ask them how they are feeling and what their expectation is. 
uh, from the outcome of the investigation is uh, uh, general uh, treatment, and we alert them that we have bad news, unfortunately, and inform them in clear and then understandable words, and then uh, we summarize the situation. The other is breaks approach. So we prepare ourselves on the background of the patient, and we create, we build the rapport again, and explore the patient's perspective and what kind of expectations they have if they are about their illness before, for example, if they are referred from other doctor, other doctor might, other physician might tell us, might tell them that uh, they might have cancer or what they have is, might be a very severe illness, or they might have a little bit of expectation there. So exploring those things might be possible. And we are now saying we provide information. We let them express their emotion and then summarize the the information. The other is a sad news approach. So this also starts with preparation. We set up, uh, we arrange the area, like we said earlier, and then we sit down with the patient. We start with asking what type of information they want. Do they want the general information? The details one, and then we deliver the news, especially as much as possible in delivering the news. We try to avoid any kind of fancy language. And have to expect and permit them to express their emotion and then respond to those emotions appropriately. And we have to give time, wait for them to express all of their emotions and then provide the support and summarize the information that we provided uh, for them. So as we said, spikes is uh, most commonly used the way of uh, delivering bad news. So we set up the environment first. So as we said earlier, we try to provide as much as possible private uh, setting. We have to make the patient sit down and be comfortable, quiet environment. That's good. And we explore the, the perception of the patient about the, uh, about the illness. So what kind of illness do you think you have? Or, or what are your expectations for this investigation kinds of things. And then we invite them to uh, break news. So here we give them the opportunity to uh, choose whether they have they want to hear the news or not. And if they want to hear uh, the news, how much they want to hear it, or whether they want to hear the diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, or only the diagnosis. And then we share, based on the preparation of the patient, we share our, our the finding the knowledge of uh, what we have found the bodies. And then we deal with the emotion. So we provide the emotional support there. And then we provide, we work on the strategy with the patient. So we work on the treatment plan, future treatment plan. And we involve the patient in uh, deciding for the future uh, treatment plan. Generally, the spikes approach in this one of the most common approach. So this, these are various ways of adjusting or addressing the patient. But don't forget the four heads of uh, the four pillars of you know providing information, uh, uh, delivering bad news for the patient. We have to prepare the preparation phase. We have to prepare ourselves, the environment, and then the patient, and then we provide emotion uh, information in a very appropriate, clear, understandable way while giving time, while giving space for the patient to react to the information we are providing. And then we'll provide support for various reactions the patient might have while hearing the news. After providing support, we provide the future plan with the patient. So those are the main four pillars delivering in any kind of uh, use. These different approaches that we go through with uh, abbreviations uh, are generally different ways that are used throughout the world. But from them, spice approach is one of the most common. common. This is one of the most important things, knowing how to respond to patients' reactions. So, 
we say the patient might react in a very sad, angry, or uh, irritable manner, or even, even the patient might get into denial. So if, if the patient did start to cry or showing sadness, showing empathy is a very, very good way of dealing with empathy, listening, providing space for the patient, and also allowing them to express their sadness uh, is a very good way of handling it. It's, it's best to not, it's best to avoid, it's, not, it's best to not avoid, you know, the emotional state of the patient. If they are crying, allowing them to cry, and uh, allowing them, them to be irritable is the best way of managing the patient in any 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 uh, given part of leaving them to cry if they want to cry and giving them space and then affirming uh, what they are feeling is a very good way of uh, handling patients might also be angry for example if it, it, it leads them to be griefing uh, more so we have to understand that the patient's anger is not uh, about us or towards us. So the patient might start to yell at us. Or could we see anything? So those kinds of reactions might be there. So we have to know that it's not about us. It's, it's one phase of, you know, grief. So we have to understand it as, as much as possible. We have to avoid being defensive. We have to avoid trying to or make them happy by providing uh, unnecessary optimistic information or providing uh, validation uh, prematurely as much as possible allowing them to express their anger and explore why they are angry is the best way of handling that patients might get into all body that so it's also part of process of grieving so we have to make sure that they understand the information because we have to get them out of denial and we have to explore the reason for the denial. Patients might have a cultural interpretation of the illness they have and then might express some cultural uh, treatment uh, help them in, get them out of the condition there. While doing that, while exploring the reason, it's better not to argue with the patient's model of understanding. So patients might tell us that Somebody here might be, you know, having uh, some kind of magic or witchcraft kind of understanding of magic. It's better, it's better not to argue with them or trying to convince with them, uh, convince them. So we have to know that it takes time to adjust to the new reality they are facing. So as much as possible, involving family members that are willing, and if they refuse treatment, is the best way of. Uh, Managing it, but, but the denial might be generally blunt or moderate kind of denial. For example, you tell them that they have cancer, and then they, they might say, How could this be? I have a good lifestyle, and then I have avoided to do these things, and I, I have a very good way of life living. This kind of reasoning might be there, and then you have to provide more information uh, to get them through. The last one is they might feel also anxious. Before. So generally, the, if there is a threat of physical health, anybody could get anxious and fearful. So it's usually a uh, result of anticipation. They anticipate that they are going to die, if they are going to lose their family, their business, or their role and responsibility, their promotion, their work, and other things. So this might get them um, to get anxious. So we have to validate and acknowledge their emotion and let them expose why they are. Uh, anxious and sometimes they might misperceive the implication of the disease. While the, while the implication of the disease might not be that much bigger as they thought. So asking asking them what kind of implication they are thinking might also uh, help uh, to deal with the uh, cause of it. So generally we have to always give enough time for the patient to express their emotion and if we don't have time, if we are working in the emergency or the other, other setup, using additional staff might be helpful so that we can go out and go about uh, our uh, other activities and then the rest of the staff will take care of the rest of the procedure. And suggesting additional counseling if, they, if you feel like the patient needs more help is also good. 
if they are not to take daily wishes and design and those like for so some patients, especially end of life issues, arise and then the patient might prefer to die immediately or something, taking their life on their own terms. And it's better to garner as much as possible support from the patient, so providing family support and social support groups and like you should also, as the last message, don't forget to take care of yourself. Especially if the patient is, uh, if, if the patient is your patient, and have been following, uh, checking, following you for a long time, it, it might also be traumatic for you, uh, traumatic things to do for you to deliver the band. And so you have, to, um, you have to take your time, you don't you have to as much as possible avoid blaming yourself if there is nothing you can do. There is nothing you can do. That's not your fault. And getting hopeless, getting emotional, frustrated, getting burnout. These are some of the symptoms that the physician really affected by the, the bad news. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sure it has been a lengthy uh, lecture. We can, uh, we can go to the question and answer. Yeah, thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, and uh, uh, it hasn't been actually, this has been a quite uh, uh, interesting and a fair, you have used a fair amount of time. Uh, it's just we started a, a little bit uh, late, so uh, because of the network, of course, so that, uh, that's yeah. why we have to conclude it uh, early. Uh, so, participants, yeah. If you guys have any questions related to the, the, the topic, please write it in the Q&A section only. Uh, and uh, Dr. Abdul Salam will address those. So since we have a, a very limited time and it's already getting uh, really late, we will only uh, respond to a few uh, questions. So let's uh, go to the questions. Yeah. So, who is responsible to break bad news? Any profession? Anybody could break bad news, actually. So, there is no really preference for uh, bad news. If there is a patient, if there is, if the physician is already there, who has been following the patient, you know, who has been treating him, it's better to convey those maybe by, by, that, by that specific physician, because the patient and the uh, physician are very familiar. And then that way, the patient will get comfortable to express their emotion, to ask questions, and also to plan uh, the future treatment ahead. So as much as possible, the treating physician uh, should break the body. How can we respond for suicidal ideation? So I think this is a very um, an excellent question, actually that needs a more uh, a prolonged kind of uh, elaboration. We generally do the risk assessment for suicide. Is it a real, a real uh, kind of, uh, I mean, uh, is the prospect of committing suicide in the future for that specific patient, high or low, uh, that should be uh, determined. There are various scales, sad person scale is a very, the quickest way of, uh, uh, deciding whether the patient is going, is going to commit suicide or not. Sometimes the patient is really convinced that he's going to commit suicide and he might even have a plan, I am going to do this, I'm going to buy a gun here, I'm going to uh, buy a poison here and then I'm going to take it, I'm going to hang my cat. These are kind of things that, that tells us that the patient is, uh, the patient really have a serious suicidal plan. So in those cases, involving the family members, and also adding a psychiatric or mental health professional is a very good way of managing. If the patient is alcoholic, have a suicidal uh, uh, substance abuse problem in the past, and uh, have a very poor support, lives alone, unmarried, kind of things also might uh, predispose the patient to, uh, to be highly high risk for suicide. So stratifying the suicidal addiction and then uh, adding a mental health professional might be helpful. So, so what we...
we do it, it seems like that uh, it's still following you and i really recommend that you get mental health counseling from uh, uh, people here we have a uh, professional here who provide that kind of support and i really recommend you to get that kind of help if this response by uh, this option for the patient then uh, referring or linking them to mental health professional here. so waiting in the step in the scenario of many patients waiting outside at the NUPD in the garden. Yeah, gyne, so gyne of Salai is very, very short period of time. We don't have time to deal with those uh, emotions. If, if you don't have enough time to deal with those emotions, it's better to uh, make things fast and then give the patient to express the emotions later after the procedure or whatever we are planning to do. What was the other question? Uh, another question is from Dr. Takala. Uh, how about breaking days? Uh, is there anything new about that? Breaking days usually, you know, we, we, it's better to not drag it. You know, there is not much enough information that we are going through them anyway, because there is no future treatment or any other thing, unfortunately. So as much as possible, getting them seated and then uh, telling them what we have been doing to them uh, what, what uh, how the ways of help that we try to uh, give the patient and unfortunately uh, the patient couldn't make it in alone but just another another challenge you know, drag it dragging it out with no further you know plan of treatment or further uh, information you can pass which are available so I'm sorry, we, we tried to do it, 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 it but unfortunately, uh, the person didn't make it. I'm sorry, say this in the long channel, and then we'll allow them to express their emotions. Okay. Well, Other question? Let's take uh, one last one. So this is from an anonymous uh, attendee, and uh, he or she is saying, what if the bad news announcement makes the person sudden ill? that causes days like heart attack or something. Yeah, yeah that's very tricky, <laughs> tricky thing actually. We don't really know when, if the patient is already at risk of having second heart attack, for example, the patient might uh, have prior history of heart attack and then we're afraid that he's going to have another heart attack and might not get, uh, might not manage or get the news uh, in a very good way. In, the, in, the, in those cases, it's better to have another family member together and breaking the news in a very stepwise fashion is a very good way. Of, and uh, I, it gives the patient chance, you know, to handle the news. So we just don't bombard them with uh, the news at first sight. You know, to tell them that they, they have this kind of illness and then the DTCs were done. But unfortunately, some of the results show some illness around your heart and then giving it up some time. But this illness will be treated with this, this kind of things might be helpful. But eventually, whatever happens for the patient, it's mandatory to provide the patient the information they need. So, one of the safest way, medical guardian, ethically speaking, is uh, if we are unsure of the consequences of the bad news that it might uh, uh, bring for the patient, it's better to ask them or tell them the risks that we are uh, considering directly. So I'm, I have really some bad news for you, but I don't think you'll take it very well. Let's let's just uh, get you in a very good way, let's let's this first and then uh, we'll talk about it later kind of things might also be helpful or giving them the choice if they want to know now or kind of things might also be helpful. Because then the patient might be uh, accused us of not telling them the necessary information. So it's best to leave that decision to the patient. But generally preparing yourself to whatever is going to come is good. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, 
Abdul Salam for giving you for taking your time to give us this amazing presentation. And this was a really a last time presentation. So uh, thank you so much for sacrificing your time this late and uh, to give us uh, this amazing uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And, yeah, I know we have taken uh, quite a few time. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, all uh, on on behalf of Blue Hills and Blue Hills participants and the community, we would really much appreciate it uh, uh, if you got, if you can uh, present other topics in an in another setup. So we will really love that. Yeah, thank of you. Of so course, much. of course, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> nice to meet you. I hope I'll see you again in in other uh, very interesting uh, topics. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Have a good, Have night. A good night. Thank you. Bye bye.